All right, so um, hi, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually. And so um, uh, today I'm talking about our paper, Relative Positional Encoding for Transformers with Linear Complexity. So this is a work that uh, was done during my PhD at uh, Telecom Paris, uh, which was supported by the MIT Print Frontiers uh, training project. And uh, it was a collaboration between different French uh, and and uh, Taiwanese research institutions, and this this paper is not exclusively on music, uh, but uh, because of the theme of this uh, reading group, I, I will focus on our music generation experiments, and I will also mention uh, some follow up results, uh, which uh, hopefully should be interesting to you as well. So let's get started uh, with. Uh, some context for this work. So um, when uh, we talk about music generation nowadays, uh, usually it, it involves some kind of uh, transformer-based model. So uh, hopefully most of you have already um, heard something about the transformer. So it's, it's a model that uh, is being widely used for music, uh, for, for text generation, but uh, we can use it to generate music as well. Uh, if we uh, find a way to represent music as a sequence of discrete tokens, right? And so then uh, basically we feed this model with this sequence of tokens one by one, and the model is trained to always predict the next token given uh, the history of all the previous ones. And this way uh, we can then uh, iteratively generate new music from the model uh, simply by this, by this, in this autoregressive way. And um, now, if you look uh, at this representation, this is just one one of uh, many possible representations. But uh, usually, it is it is based uh, on some on some events. So uh, you can see that we have like note on events here, note of events, and then some special tokens uh, for representing timing. So usually, we will have between two and three tokens per note. Uh, maybe more uh, if we want to represent also other kinds of information. And uh, this means that the sequences can get very long, especially if we want to do uh, polyphonic music or even multi-track music. And the problem with transformers is that they do not scale so well with, uh, with sequence uh, length. And fortunately, there has been an effort to design more efficient transformer architectures and uh, in particular, these uh, linear complexity transformers that we're going to be talking about today. Another uh, important part of, of uh, the transformer architecture are positional uh, encodings. So uh, this is this is usually considered a necessary part of the transformer architecture, uh, since uh, the uh, the attention mechanism, which is sort of the core um, component of, of the transformer is uh, a, a permutation invariant operation. So we need to add some notion of order. And so we inject usually uh, in the, this in the form of positional encodings, which are just some vectors that encode the raw indices of the tokens within the sequence. And we just add them to the, to the embeddings of, of the input tokens. And this is uh, usually called uh, some, or sometimes it's called uh, absolute positional encoding or APE. And there are other, other variants of positional encoding like relative uh, positional encoding or RPE, which uh, also can uh, in, uh, encode some sort of musically meaningful uh, positional information. And uh, it, uh, there has been work that, uh, that uh, shows this is the, the music transformer paper, which uh, suggests that this is actually something that we want to do. However, uh, this comes at some computational cost, and in particular, RPE is not compatible out of the box with linear complexity transformers. And so this is uh, the core problem that we are uh, addressing in this paper. So basically, um, what I will talk about first, um, uh, what we did in this paper is we, we applied uh, linear complexity transformers to music generation. And uh, to our knowledge, this was the first time that this has been done. We also uh, propose uh, to, to address, to bridge this gap between, uh, between RPE and 
linear complexity transformers which proposes stochastic positional encoding or SPE, which uh, is a kind of positional encoding that behaves like a relative positional encoding, but is compatible with uh, these efficient transformers. And then in the last part, uh, I will uh, talk also uh, about some uh, follow-up results, which question a little bit the role of positional encodings in music generation and uh, explore some, some alternatives. Uh, let's talk about the background. And so let's talk about the transformer self-attention. So uh, in the transformer, the, the core part uh, of the transformer is the self-attention mechanism. And um, the, the input to this is some sequence of vectors, uh, some feature vectors. And uh, we have uh, one feature vector for each element in the input sequence for every token. And then uh, the attention mechanism is sort of like, uh, like a soft dictionary mechanism. So we have some, we uh, compute some queries, some keys and some values based on these, based on these input uh, feature vectors. And then uh, basically we, uh, the attention uh, uh, tries to match these queries with these keys and then retrieve the corresponding values. Uh, this is one way to imagine attention. So basically we compute this, this attention matrix right here, which is just a matrix of dot products um, of all the queries with all the keys. So it is kind of a uh, similarity matrix between the keys and queries. And then um, we run this through the softmax. So there is exponentiation and there is some normalization. And then uh, we multiply this with the value matrix. So this uh, basically selects uh, the corresponding values. And this way we obtain the output uh, at, at each position. And as I said, uh, there is uh, also uh, the concept of positional encoding. Which is uh, which is usually added uh, directly to the uh, to the to the input of the first layer of of the transformer, and uh, this is these are just some vectors that depend uh, only on position, um, and uh, one one disadvantage of this, uh, which is known, is that uh, it doesn't extrapolate extrapolate well to longer sequences. So let's say if we train on sequences of length. 1024, and then we apply the transformers. Uh, we, we try to generate sequences that are longer, let's say 2048, uh, it will usually fail because the transformer overfits to uh, the positions that were seen during training. And one technique to alleviate this is uh, relative positional encoding, which basically says, well, we don't really care about absolute positions, but rather we care about the position differences or lags. And so instead of adding this absolute position information to the input of the, of the network, we will instead add some uh, relative positional information to the attention matrix in, in some shift invariant way. So basically here we have the uh, dot product matrix uh, and we add to it some other matrix, which uh, basically depends on the differences between uh, the indices and not on the absolute indices. Um, now uh, let's let's talk about linear complexity transformers. So basically, these try to uh, uh, serve us. They they try to uh, alleviate the the, the computational uh, complexity of the transformer. So normally in the transformer we have to compute uh, this matrix, which is uh, n by n matrix, if the length of the input sequence is n. And um, uh, so it, the, the complexity of the self-attention mechanism is, is n squared. And what linear transformers or linear complexity transformers do is they decompose this attention matrix uh, into two smaller matrices, one of which depends only on the queries and the other one only on the keys. And they depend uh, on them via this feature mapping phi. And then it turns out uh, that if we choose uh, this um, mapping well, we can actually uh, approximate uh, this, this original attention matrix. And notice that after we apply this mapping, everything here is linear. These are just matrix multiplications. 
So we can uh, rearrange this expression and we can first multiply the keys with the values and then uh, multiply this result with the queries. And uh, all of these operations have, have linear uh, time and space complexity. So uh, this allows us to uh, compute some kind of approximate attention in, uh, uh, in linear, uh, linear complexity. Uh, another a nice property uh, is that not, not only we can we train these models fast, we can also generate efficiently. Um, so uh, basically, normally in the transformer, uh, when we try to generate the new token, um, we have a new query that we are uh, that we are uh, that appears, and we need to uh, compute the uh, attention of this query to all the past keys and values in order to compute the new output. However, in linear complexity transformers, uh, we can uh, aggregate these keys and values into some matrix, which does not depend on the sequence length. So this is some kind of state, uh, a bit like an RNN state. And so then uh, this is the only thing that, that we need to keep in memory as we are generating. And so uh, we can then uh, generate in, in constant memory and uh, constant time per token, uh, um, uh, regarding the, the length of the input sequence. Uh, so this is nice, but now, uh, as I said, linear complexity transformers are not, not compatible with RPE. And why is that? Well, because to compute RPE, we need to access the attention matrix in order to augment it with dispositional information. Uh, for that, we need to compute the matrix, but this is exactly what a linear complexity transformers are trying to avoid. So uh, this is what we are uh, addressing here, we want to come up with a relative positional encoding that will be uh, compatible with uh, this way of computing attention. And so we propose uh, stochastic positional encoding or, or SPD. And uh, to understand how this works, let's take a closer look at RPE again. So relative positional encoding, uh, this is the same, but just uh, written written out. So we have this, uh, this is our uh, our attention matrix, queries uh, times keys. And we add to this some terms and each term uh, corresponds to one dimension of, uh, of the key, uh, sorry, of the query vectors. And for this dimension, we have uh, uh, something called uh, a positional kernel, which uh, tells us uh, how uh, this particular dimension of the queries um, responds to different uh, different uh, relative positions, different uh, differences in positions. And so this is multiplied call, uh, this is multiplied row wise by the queries. Now we propose a slightly modified version where instead of adding this, we uh, insert uh, the, uh, the positional kernel in between the queries and keys. So if you look at this, this is basically uh, this is basically uh, the matrix multiplication between the query matrix and the key matrix, but we insert the, in between this, this uh, coefficient that depends on the, uh, on the relative position of the key to the query. And so now this is the expression that we want to compute, right? But uh, now this is, this is, uh, we don't know yet how to do this in linear complexity. Uh, so our goal is to rewrite this in this form so that uh, we can then plug it, plug it into the linear attention mechanism, right? So we want to rewrite this approximately in this form where this Q hat are some modified queries uh, and K hat are some modified keys uh, that we then uh, use in the attention mechanism. And to, uh, how do we construct those? Well, uh, our goal here is to decompose this uh, positional kernel, P sub D, as a product of some query positional encodings and uh, key positional encodings, right? So this is basically some, uh, this uh, is a part that will go with the queries. This part will go with the keys. And then um, we can, uh, we can, uh, we will use this query positional encoding to augment our queries. 
uh, we will use the key positional encoding to augment the keys. So this way we'll, we'll get this Q hat and K hat. And then uh, it turns out that if we multiply those together, we will get the desired pattern in the positional link and in the, in the attention uh, matrix. And uh, how we construct these positional encodings is by sampling for some, from some stochastic processes with uh, cross covariance P sub D. Right? And so this ensures that if we, if we multiply these things together, on average, we get, uh, we approximate uh, this positional kernel. And I will not go into detail about how exactly we construct these stochastic processes, but I will say that we, we propose two variants um, of SPE. One has a vanishing behavior. So this means we have some sort of band around the, the diagonal in the attention uh, matrix, and then uh, it, it vanishes to zero. And uh, this, is, this is based on some convolutional mechanism. And uh, the other variant is periodic. So it is a pattern that is composed of some sinusoids uh, that, that repeat indefinitely. All right, so now let's, let's talk about, I, I hope this is, uh, this is uh, clear, at least in, uh, on a higher, high level. And uh, let's, let's talk about the experiments that we did on music generation. And the first, uh, first experiment or set of experiments was on pop music uh, piano generation. Uh, we trained um, a kind of linear complexity transformer, which is called the performer, um, on uh, some pop MIDI uh, piano data set. And, um, we trained it on sequences of length up to 2048 and tested on sequences up to length 4096. So basically we're uh, testing extrapolation up to double the training sequence length. And so what we can see here is in this, in this part, this is, the, this is the sequence length lengths that were actually seen during training. Uh, and we have, um, this is a plot of the validation cross entropy loss as a function of the position in the sequence. So for these uh, training, uh, this position seen during training, you can actually see that uh, at least some of the SPE variants outperform uh, slightly absolute positional encoding. So that's already a good sign. And then uh, as soon as we reach positions that were unseen during training, absolute positional encoding shoots up sharply, right? And uh, the behavior of SPE is, is more stable, especially of this uh, conv uh, convolutional uh, ungated variant. Uh, and we, if we look at the attention matrices uh, that are that are um, that we can extract from the transformers. So here, this is basically on this axis we have the, the queries, and on this one the keys. And so we can see that basically. This is the plot for absolute positional encoding. But as we go along the sequence length, there is always some uh, some attention on the current position. But as the sequences get too long, at some point it, the attention just snaps to some constant position, and this happens for uh, for like uh, uh, many of the attention heads. And so this means basically now that the model is not able to to attend to these positions. And so this is something that happens somewhere in, in this region. And this explains why we have this, these high values in, in the uh, validation process. On the other hand, um, the, uh, the, the attention uh, patterns that we observe in SPE are, are uh, always stable over the length of the sequence. And so this is exactly uh, what we were looking for. Uh, I'm now going to play uh, some some examples. So this was this was just validation losses on uh, right computed on the validation set. Now I will uh, show what happens when we actually try to generate some sequences, uh, some new music from these models. Here uh, we have an example from uh, generated from the model with absolute positional encoding. And uh, well, let me know if you can if you can actually hear this.
Okay, um, so, so far so good. Uh, but when we go to some later positions, we see, we see that at some point there is sort of a cutoff and then the generated output becomes completely unmusical. Uh, and the, the rhythm completely breaks down. I'm not even gonna play this because this is, uh, well, mostly just silence anyway. And this happens for virtually all of the examples that we have here. You can, you can check those uh, yourself if you want to. Uh, on the other hand, if we try one of the SPE models, um, let's listen to this example. hear that uh, up until the end of the of the piece it it um, it sounds uh, very much musical um, uh, basically as, as as we saw in the so this confirms of what we saw in the plus um, now we did uh, also another set of experiments uh, on complement continuation in this uh, case uh, we trained again uh, these performers uh, but now on, on synthetically generated accompaniments in different styles, um, uh, up to maximum sequence length of 512. And we tested them on continuation. So we, we uh, fed the model with um, a prompt, uh, two bars of a prompt, and then uh, generated, let it generate a continuation and uh, test it using some style fit metrics whether the generated continuation fits uh, the style of the prompt or not. Um, and so these uh, are the results. Uh, the higher, uh, the better in this case. And so uh, we can see that um, for these positions that are seen during training, uh, absolute and stochastic positional encoding both perform kind of on par. Uh, however, um, for later positions, um, which were not seen during training, the, uh, the performance of AP again drops quite uh, drastically while uh, the performance of SP stays more stable. So it's the same trend as, as before. And if you're interested in examples, they are, they are available on the, on the website as well. So now I would like to talk about uh, the follow-up experiments that we did. Uh, these are not part of the paper anymore but uh, they're included in my PhD thesis. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, check this out if you're, if you're interested. And basically the first question that we try to address is, is positional encoding even necessary for music generation? Um, what happens, uh, what happens if, if uh, we get rid of it, right? And so, so the, uh, the conventional answer is yes, it is necessary uh, because otherwise, uh, there would be no notion of order um, in the computation of the transformer. However, it turns out that for causally masked transformers, this is actually not the case. The positional encodings are actually not necessary. Um, and so why is this the case? Well, let's just take a look at what this causally masked attention looks like. We have here um, the queries and the keys. And so basically this uh, causal masking just makes sure that uh, we cannot query something that is in the future. So all the keys uh, that are uh, have later or uh, greater positions than the query are masked out. The so first key, first query can only access the first key. The second query can only access the first two keys, et cetera. And so what every key sees, uh, every key basically sees one more key than the previous one. And this arguably is what, uh, imbues the model with some notion of order. And uh, basically this, uh, this makes it unnecessary to include positional encoding. And this, this has, been, has been studied and it is actually 
what we observe in our experiments as well. So this is the same experiment as before, but we have added this uh, no PE model, which has no positional encoding whatsoever. And we can see that indeed, this no PE uh, model performs uh, just as well as any of the other um, positional encoding variants, uh, which is already kind of unexpected because normally uh, we actually do see some performance drop when we remove the positional encoding. And secondly, uh, it, it has the same stable uh, behavior for, uh, for these later uh, positions, for this extrapolation um, experiment. So uh, this, is, this is very interesting, right? So uh, basically what, what this tells us, I think, is that um, these index-based uh, positional encodings are not necessarily very useful for music generation, or at least on this particular uh, in this particular case. And so, actually, encoding, uh, including some positional encoding, can even be harmful if we are trying to do something like extrapolation. So, uh, all right. So, if this is the case, uh, our next question was: Can we? Uh, repurpose these classical positional encodings in a musically meaningful way. So if you look at uh, the sinusoidal, classical sinusoidal APE, uh, it's computed like this. So it's just some uh, set of sinusoids at different frequencies uh, as a function of the position. And this position, this is just the index of, of the token, right? And in what we propose is this metrical positional encoding or MPE, where we replace this uh, token index, which is not very meaningful, arguably for music generation, with some metrical timing information, uh, specifically the number of ticks from the beginning of the piece, uh, where we consider 12 ticks per beat. Uh, we also, um, so we train, uh, in this case, uh, vanilla transformers, because uh, we we thought this is a this is a question that uh, that well re requires a, a more more basic question that uh, deserves some investigation. So we trained now in this case vanilla transformers, not linear complexity, but vanilla transformers, um, and uh, not with relative positional encoding, but only with this proposed MPE, APE, and uh, then uh, also without any positional encoding. Uh, we trained these on the on the LAC MIDI data set. And we also experimented with two different uh, encoding strategies uh, for timing. So remember, we are encoding music as a sequence of tokens, and we have some special tokens that represent timing. And the classical way uh, is uh, here, what we call a delta encoding here, where each uh, of the, these time shift tokens uh, has this argument which says how many ticks Basically, we move forward in time. Um, the second strategy that we test is uh, this beat relative encoding, which we uh, proposed in an earlier paper, where the shift is given in beats and ticks. So this, uh, this says how many beats we want to shift. Uh, uh, and then uh, this can be a number, this can be zero or more. Uh, and then the ticks argument says uh, which which uh, tick within the beat what we want to land on. So this is sort of uh, this is relative to the beginning of the beat. And so the uh, if you think about it, the idea uh, behind this metrical positional encoding and this beat relative encoding is similar. We are we are providing the model with some sort of uh, metrical grid. We are we are saying, uh, we are providing it with the information with where the beats are. And uh, we think that this can help the model um, basically get anchored to this metrical grid and, and uh, that should help it, that should prevent it from making timing errors. Okay, so here are the results. First, let's look at uh, the model cross entropies um, and um, now, uh, so this is uh, here is the, is the tokenization strategy, right? And this one is what kind of information we encode in the 
um, sinusoidal positional encoding. And these are two independent things. So first, uh, we observed that APE and NTE perform a kind of the same in both cases, with APE being slightly better. Um, and no PE actually uh, is uh, quite substantially worse. The difference is much bigger than between these two. So actually, we see that uh, the positional encoding does make does have make some difference, and it, it apparently makes the learning task uh, somewhat easier because we we obtain uh, we obtain a lower uh, loss. However, the situation is different if you look at if we try to actually generate uh, some music from these models. So we again performed a, a continuation experiment where we give the model a prompt, we generate the continuation, and we test uh, how well it fits the style of the prompt. And uh, here are the results. So what we can see are these are the same metrics as before. Uh, there is one additional metric here. And so what we can see is that basically uh, this proposed metrical positional encoding uh, does help in this case. And uh, the, the winner overall seems to be this delta encoding with uh, MPE, which is interesting. And um, I guess it's uh, the, the, the thing here is that this delta encoding is something that is easy to predict. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a simple linear representation. However, we still uh, inform the model um, about the position within the metrical grid via this metrical positional encoding. And that's what uh, makes it perform well. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, absolute positional encoding really performs uh, quite badly. Um, and I don't have a clear explanation for this, but uh, it's possible that uh, this index information is just uh, pretty irrelevant for, for the generation. And I don't know, there might be some overfitting at play or, or something like that. Um, Finally, I want to say uh, this, this whole analysis should be taken with a, with a grain of salt. It's just a quick, uh, quick follow-up experiment. Uh, we didn't do any hyperparameter tuning uh, for each of the models. We didn't also tune the uh, parameters of the sampling procedure, like the, like the softmax temperature and, and top K sampling uh, parameters or top P sampling parameter. So uh, this is something that we might want to do. But still, uh, this raises interesting questions. I think that uh, uh, merits some further investigation. Um, so to wrap up, uh, basically uh, what uh, we have seen is that first, linear complexity uh, transformers uh, do work for, for music generation um, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, some more work that, that explores this. Um, regarding our, our proposed SPE, uh, it is, this is a mechanism that enables uh, relative positional encoding within uh, linear complexity transformers. And even though our follow-up experiments cast some doubt on the overall role of positional encodings in uh, music generation, we saw that uh, uh, SPE did help in, in some of the experiments, uh, even if just for uh, in terms of the loss values. And moreover, we have other results in the paper, which I did not show here, uh, which are on uh, non-music tasks, where uh, the position where positional encoding is actually necessary in order to solve the task. So um, and on these, this uh, benchmark, uh, the, the results are promising as well. I also want to say that SP is not the only effort in this direction. There are uh, there have been other papers uh, that uh, also um, try to somehow implicitly uh, induce some positional patterns in the attention matrix. Um, so uh, I encourage you to to check those out as well. And finally, um, I think we should. Uh, question our our assumptions and practices around transformers and and in particular we 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 have seen that positional encodings are not set in stone we can get quite creative in what kind of information uh well we use them to to represent 
Uh, in some cases, we might not need them at all. Um, and also there is no reason why we should stick to sinusoidal ones um, or index-based ones. Uh, uh, this, can, this is, this is uh, something very open and um, yeah, so um, uh, I would like to, to end here and um, thanks, thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. And well, here I'm showing the URLs of, with the examples uh, if you want to check those out.